And I, this is going to probably be brief today, but it's just like, this is what's on my heart. It's like, um, I was talking to, to the guys that worship this morning, worship practice that, um, I was talking to my wife about this last time. It's just like, the longer you go, the further you walk with God, the more you see, the more you endure, the more you experience. You know, you pick up a limp here and there. You pick up a scar here and there. You pick up some things that that change you, that, that mark time in your life. And, and sometimes it's, you carry those things with you. And so the, the, the thing that I want to point to Matthew 21, verse number 28 and 30, he says, what do you think? And he said, a man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go, work the day in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterwards, he regretted and he, regretted and he went. He came to the second and said, likewise, and he answered and said, I go, sir, but he did not go. Now watch this. Which of the two did the will of the Father? What is God's will? What is the thing that he's the most concerned about this morning? It's not what your intentions are. It's not how you got there. It's simply that you finish. He doesn't care that you made up your mind 15 times as long as you got back in there, yeah. as long as you finished what you said, as long as you crossed the tape. Because to be honest with you, he doesn't need us for anything. Right. We need him for everything. Yeah. But the one thing he wants out of you is to cross the tape and get home. Amen. Right? Yeah. Next page. Right. Right. It's not how you drive, it's how you arrive. Anybody ever heard that? Yeah. Most of us that play golf that can't hit off the tee, right. that's our anthem. <laughs> I, I can play golf probably better than I can. I've been playing since I was 16. That's, that's 43 years, and I'm still as bad as I was when I started. Because I come out of my shoes when I try to hit it off the tee. I mean, if I can't hit it as hard as I can, then what's the point? Okay? One guy told me, you'll have to slow down your backswing and live with the extra distance. And so, uh, but it's like, you know, so I'm doubling off the tee, but then I'll grab that short iron and I'll love it too until I hit about 10, until I get to the green, and then I'll free putt. So that's my golf game. <laughs> but the phrase is, it's not how you drive, it's how you arrive. You don't drive, you drive for show, but you putt for no. In other words, it's not how you get there, it's what you do at the end that makes the difference. It's when you get to the place that God's called you to be and finish your course, finish your ministry, finish your assignment. We are also entangled with the minutia, that's a new word if you don't know what that is, of our lives. The little tiny details. Oh my gosh, we're drowning in so many details and so many things that just occupy thought space, that occupy the billboards of our mind. That's all we do is we think about these little things and none of that stuff is going to make it past the fire. We're paralyzed with every single decision, detail, and outcome. What all God really cares about is that you finish, but more importantly, that you finish well. You understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. Finish well. Yeah. That you get there and you've held the course. That you've gotten there and you haven't renounced him. That you've gotten there and you haven't, right. and you have done something in the end of your life. Samson, in his entire life, could not get anything right. I mean, it's like every, at every turn, he did something dumb. He, he, uh, you know, he ate honey out of a carcass. He did all this. He was a Nazarite. He was, he was sworn to, dedicated to God at birth. And, and it's like, in fact, the first time I learned most of this stuff is, is uh, this man right here had me come in and beat me up as Samson. And so I learned most of the stuff because of, of this man right here in his children's ministry about what uh, he had to do in his life. He's a Nazarite. He wasn't supposed to touch anything dead. He wasn't supposed to date outside of the, the Israelites. But he did that too. He did all these things that were wrong. And finally, and, and he kept doing these things so wrong that by the time he got to Delilah, he was already toast. I mean, he was so cocky and full of himself that he thought, you know what, I'm strong. I can handle anything. I can do whatever I want. And when it finally got down to it, he came to the place to where Delilah said, they, they banned him with ropes. They banned him, you know, all these different things. And finally she said, what is the source of your strength? And he said, uh, well, my mom always said, <laughs> I, I don't think you're stupid. I think you're so cocky. He said, if you'll cut all my hair off, I'll be like everybody else. And guess what? She sent the soldiers that cut his hair off 
And he was as weak as every other man. The problem was, is when the soldiers came in, he jumped up to face them. You know why? Because he couldn't tell the difference between being anointed and not. Because he'd been willing away in his relationship and because he'd been compromising and willing away and to the point that where he everyday life, he'd already gotten it and didn't even know. Is anybody still with me? Luke chapter 14. Verse number 28 and 29 says, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see will begin to mock him. And I want to tell you something. I've got some famous examples, and, and I was going to tell somebody else's story, but one of them is going to be mine. That when we first started renovating this building, a guy came by here and and offered me to do offered to do something for me, and we didn't have the money to do it. I thought, well, okay. Well, he started on it, but then he started demanding money. I told him at the beginning we didn't have the money, so it was, it was putting this stucco on the outside of the building. Well, the front of the building stayed that way probably for ten years, with just styrofoam stuck up there, breaking off. It was it was absolutely it was just the most uh, embarrassing thing for me. Because we had started, but we didn't have enough money to finish. And so there is a monument to failure for everyone in the city. And anybody that cared to look up was to, to look up and see how we had not counted the cost. And we had started and not finished. I, there were some people I know that started a building project on their church. And they, they raised money and they built the foundation. But then they couldn't continue through. And the building sat out there. And finally they raised money to put a privacy fence. To hide the shame. And I'm just telling you, this is the trick of the devil. What he wants you to do is start half cocked. He wants you to start with half of your, you know, commitment. Right. Okay. Are you all in or not? If you're all in, it doesn't matter. But if you're not all in, the first sign of trouble, the first sign of, of difficulty, the first sign of challenge, you'll back off. And then that will be your everlasting shame. He'll say, look here, you began and you couldn't finish. How many of you know that God is all about the finish? Yeah. Galatians 6 9 says, Let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, everybody said due season. We shall reap if we do not lose heart. Why did he put that in there? Because it's easy to lose heart. I'm just telling you, it's easy to lose heart. And if you have not lost heart, I don't think you've tried much. Because if you're not stepping out on faith and trying to do what God's called us to do and leaning over into the impossible, we haven't even begun to do the thing we were put here to do. If everything's easy and cozy and predictable, we haven't engaged God at all. He's not even obligated to do anything because we haven't even, we haven't even engaged his ability to do anything because we're all doing it under our own strength. Oh, it must be right. Now, this word due season is the one that stuck out to me. I told him in worship this morning. Uh, I've had about a dozen people come to me in the last month. They're saying different things, different places, different backgrounds, but they've all come up and had something to say differently. I mean, they've all had the same thing to say, even though they're different people. And they keep reminding me about the seasons of life. I told them this, I'll tell you. They said, you know, that God put this thing together in Genesis. He said that as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, they're all going to be here. That we can pretend and confess and say, I'm just, I'm just not believing for winter. Right, uh, right. I'm just going to keep my bathing suit on, my flip-flops, I'm going to walk right out there. You know what, if you're in Montana, it'll kill you. No matter how much you confess it, this is God's doing. God put this thing in place. That there are seasons. There are times when things are here. There are times when things are flourishing. There are times when it dries up and it's not here. And this is by design. And I'm just trying to tell everybody, this may be a word of this for you. It was a word for me that, you know what, you cannot go into the next season till you let the last one go. Because what you're looking for is in the next season. It's not, you've already looked here, it's not here. But you're holding on because this is predictable. This is something that you can, you can measure. You, you know how this is going to be. And the unknown, just like it was to Israel going into the wilderness, why did they try to go back to Egypt? Because they knew what that was like. To live by faith is to trust in God that you're going to enter into things that you have no idea what you're doing. And it's scary. It's just not comfortable. It's just not fun. Right. When I go to a restaurant, I'm more likely to order the exact same thing yes. <laughs> every time I go. Is anybody with me? Because yeah. I've had that experience. And once I said, try this, I wasted a meal because it was terrible. And I knew I would like that. Right. 
We're those kind of creatures. We don't like to do to to change very many things. Okay? Yeah. I've had the same hairstyle since I was in high school. At least I have hair. Next page. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's everybody's way to be praying to fall out. See, he's got the most faith. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It says, therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Why am I saying this? Because this is the whole deal. The whole, the whole thing we're about today is that this life we're living is not about us. Even though we try as hard as we can, and the line starts here, to make it all about me. Okay? It's not about me. There's a cloud of witnesses that are looking. Have you ever heard of the six degrees, degrees of separation? You ever heard that phrase? Yeah. That means that we're six degrees away from touching the entire world. You ever done the Kevin Bacon test? Yeah. Pretty amazing. Okay? If you don't know what I'm talking about, then you can go in and, and type in any actor, and he'll, he's connected to Kevin Bacon somehow. <laughs> Try it. It's amazing. I think, There's no way. That Charlie Chaplin, yeah, there's a way that he's connected to Kevin Bacon. That six degrees of separation means that I know Clint, Clint knows somebody, they know somebody, they know somebody. If you go six layers, you will have reached the whole entire population of the world. Wow. That's why these witnesses that we're watching us are so important. That it's not about, you know, we don't need satellites, we just need a life that is a satellite. We need somebody that's living a life out loud, and, you know, especially in difficulty, especially when things aren't going right, especially when you can't move your arm and you're, yeah. you know, I'm just going to be honest with you, I'm not going to hide that and tell you that I wasn't just terrified. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not terrified now with the gym last time. I didn't get to do all I wanted to do, but I did a little bit. Let me take something. I did a little, and that's all I needed was a little bit. Yeah. There's a little great kind of witnesses. So therefore, let us lay aside. Let us lay aside. You know, I like this because it didn't say, Brother Rick, work through it. Come on, that's right. Okay. Figure it out. That's right. Trace it down your family tree. He said, you know what? You're wasting your time. Just lay aside. Yeah. You don't gotta, you don't get a name for it and a, and a cause for it and, and a genealogy for it. Just throw it away. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Lord. And the sin, everybody knows what sin is. That's right. What is sin? It means missing the mark. Oh, good. No, it's still bad. Still leads to death. It's just missing the mark. If the mark is life, you're missing it in the death area. All right. And the sin which so easily ensnares us to let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking into Jesus, what? The author and finisher. Say it again. He's the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy of the sin before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Next page. Philippians 1 6, being common of this very thing. He has begun a good work in you, what? Will finish it. Yes, he will. Listen, the reason you're still here is because he's not finished with you. He's wanting you to make up your mind, I want to finish. I'm not happy or content to ride this out or float down the lazy river. I'm going to finish my course. Amen. And some of us, you know, it doesn't matter how long you've been laying dormant, it's just time for that little lightning bolt to hit and revive you like Godzilla and come up out of the ocean. You don't, you don't need my invitation. Okay. No, I can't. Next place. First Corinthians 9. And watch this one. It says, you, do you all know, do you not know that those who run in a race, do you understand? Look here. There's, do you see the, the, the comparisons in these verses? Yeah. That there's actual effort being put forth. That this is not something that just happens because we happen to be Christians or that it's just going to be by default or that it's just going to happen because that's just how it's going to be that the good Lord's going to make it happen. No, he's telling he's putting words in there like run. Yeah. Okay. Like if you don't run, you're not going to catch up to what he's wanting you to have. Okay. He says we all run in a race, but one receives a prize. Run in such a way that you beat the guy next to you. That's not what he said. He didn't say there's one prize. He's saying you got to run like you're going to win the prize. There's a way to run. There's a way to live. There's a way to carry yourself. There's a way to set your eyes, to set your jaw. It says, I'm going to run in such a way that I'm going to obtain the prize. 
Because everyone that competes for the prize is temperate in all things. You know, I just, I, I keep waiting for Nike to call me to give them an endorsement for their new basketball shoe. For some reason, they don't want my endorsement. Because I'm 5'10 and my vertical leap is about a quarter of an inch. I'm not a real good billboard for their new shoe. But God is telling us, I need you to be my billboard for what I've called you to be, for the life that I've given you, for the love that Jesus has put. I need you to be the glowing example to a world full of witnesses what it would be like if they would invite him in. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So it means that we're temperate in all things. That means that we can't just let go and do whatever we feel like doing because right. some of that's going to affect somebody else in a way that might cast a bad light on who we're serving. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run not with uncertainty. I fight not as one who beats there. You know, I found out that uh, I was real good with a heavy bag. Okay. When I was taking martial arts, I was really, man, I had that spin and kick and everything. But I found out something that the, the, uh, the, the, the bag didn't hit back. Uh, and it moves, you know, it stays right there, and the person I'm trying to hit, he's moving around. So I found out that all these good theories I have about all these good moves and stuff are of no use until I've actually put them into play and actually get engaged in some sort of warfare. Okay, right. right. But I discipline my body. In fact, the word discipline my body is in, in the King James says uh, buffet or buffet. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that. It means literally to black your eye. Kind of like Santa. <laughs> going to happen to Santa. He was getting out of line. Was to get back in line. If you black your own eye to make yourself do what's right. And oh, look, look, look at it or not, that's sometimes what it takes. Right. Sometimes it takes you overriding that, oh. that craving and that desire and that everything in you that wants to do what's against the word of God. But something in you has got to rise up and say, I will not cave in to these feelings or these desires. I will do what God has said to do. Amen? Yes. Why do we do that? Why do I bring my body to subjection? Because after I preach to others, I don't want to be the one that's disqualified. When it, back in the 80s when I was first getting saved, and, and uh, a lot of TV preachers had very uh, visible fog. And I was sitting there in the office full of people who were just heretics. And I watched this happen. And I thought, you know what? Their whole life work is destroyed. Because of this one thing. Yes, sir. All that's forgotten. All the salvations and the Bible colleges and the people. All that's forgotten. Not by God, but by the witnesses. Right. Because of what? Because I'm just telling you what. That when we do what we're supposed to do, if you think the world's going to be happy with you, they're not. They're not going to like you a bit. Because when you walk in the room, you bring conviction. When you walk in the room, you bring a presence that they've been trying to discredit and, 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 and explain away. They can't because now, you know, you brought it, into the, you brought it right into the place. I was like, you know, it's like I was, every time I walk outside at night, I'm just blown away. Uh, Pastor Cameron told me about there's a, another meteor shower coming up. And I'm like, I just love this stuff. I had my poor kids out on a blanket. It was 20 degrees. <laughs> I just caught the, I built a tent, put a kerosene heater on it. Caught on fire. Oh. It's all right. They remember it. <laughs> but when I look out there in my backyard and I look up in the sky and I see right there is, is Jupiter. And it's 800 million miles away and I'm looking at it. Right. It's right there. Right. It's that far away, but it's real. And when you see these little, just little bitty things, when you see the, the miracle of life, the, the look at nature in any kind of way, look at what somebody said pictures around about those snowflakes. Y'all see that? Yeah. How pristinely perfect they are. How can any of this happen accidentally? Right. Right. Without a divine design, without somebody right. putting something in place. And so when you see all that and you realize that this is about more than me, it's about more than me whether my football team wins, it's about more than me whether or not I get what I want for Christmas, it's about more than me whether or not everything, all my little dreams that I've been hanging my hat on come true. It's about more than that. Right. Anybody with me? Yeah. Next page. Yeah. Well, the first thing is finishing law number one. I'm going to start with this. 
I got several lists here. So hang with me. First thing we're going to do, if you're going to finish well, you're going to have to learn to lay aside every weight. Yes. If you think that you're going to finish well and harbor and keep pet sin in your life, you're not. It will find a way to destroy you. It will find a way to destroy you. Yeah. It's not God doing it. You're doing it. Yeah. You're, it's like you're inviting a snake in your house and you're wondering why I bit you. It's a snake! Right. Right. Next. you got to run with patience. Okay. It's like I said last week. I, I don't mind running with patience. I just want to run a little faster. Right. Well, that's the problem with this because let me tell you what patience is. Can you stay with me just for a second? Yeah. Patience is the one thing that Satan cannot stand. Mm -hmm. This is how we destroy him. Because we don't have to be in a hurry. We've got eternity. His time is short. Oh, yeah. Come on, now. Yeah. Come on, kid. I don't got to get in there, gun. He's the one the clock's ticking. He's the one that we're going to throw him in the hole one day. I ain't got anywhere to be. Yes. Next. Number three, you got to run like a winner. And I'm going to be honest with you. This one, I was a kid, it's called having class. Yeah. Right. Having a work ethic. Having something about you. Mm -hmm. My dad always said, be somebody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether you're a ditch digger or, or you know, the president of the United States, be the best at what you do. Yeah. If you borrow somebody's thing, you hand it back to them better. If you borrow a car, you wash it. Fill up with gas. You don't just, you know, you, you make a mark with a life that says, I'm going to live a higher life than what everyone else is. Doing. I'm going to raise the standard yeah. okay. of who I am. Come on. I'm going to be a winner. Number two, number four, is I got to get control of myself. Okay. Now, this is a bad time of year to talk about that <laughs> because it's like I'm so full, I can't hurt all there's pie. <laughs> yes, I saw that. That's exactly right. Because we give ourselves permission. That's okay. I'm going to give myself permission to rein it in. Because let me tell you something. I don't care what it is. This is why I believe with all my heart that Jesus uh, let Lazarus stay in the grave. Because he's trying to teach us, if you let it lay for three days, you can beat anything. Three days, you can beat anything. Three days, you can beat, I don't care if it's heroin. You can beat heroin in three days. If you'll just dedicate yourself and say, you know what? I'm stopping this. I'm trusting God. I'm putting an end to it. And watch what God can do. Fast this thing. Pray over this thing. Whatever it is, God can make you free. Yeah. Amen. Johnny was here a minute ago. He told me that after how many years? There you are. How many years did you smoke cigarettes? Oh, 30. 30. And you just decided to find be, be done, right? Yeah. You're done, right? Yeah. Okay. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Because it's just somebody decided I'm not going to be that way anymore. I'm going, you know, it's not willpower. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. But he's got to have you put the thing in gear. Yeah. Number five. Yeah. You don't find, you don't run with uncertainty. You got to know where you're going. You know what happens when you're, when you're uncertain? You stop running. Yeah. It's kind of like this. I use it like this. If I'm in the woods... And I don't know where I'm going, Kurt. I don't really take off fast in any direction because yeah. I'm not sure where I'm going. But if I'm out in the field and I see the house, I'm going to have to run around this. I'm going to have to run and jump over that. But I've always got my eyes on the house. So I know I can run full out. I'm going to have to change course. But I know where I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. If you know where you're going, then you can look at his split hit the thing running and the devil won't be able to catch you. The only way to catch you is if he gets your ear and makes you stop. Come on. Right. Yeah. Now, number six. <laughs> Keep aimed at your enemy. Remember who your enemy is. Don't fight with each other. We're not the enemy. Your boss is not your enemy. Okay. Your spouse, your mother, your father, they are not your enemy. Your children are not your enemy. The enemy is Satan himself yeah. and all his legion. He, he's leading all these demons that are taunting you and taunting you. That is your enemy. He don't care if it manifests in disease. I don't care if it manifests in, in depression. Whatever it is, it's the devil is your enemy. Yeah. Keep aiming at him, not at each other. Yeah. Right. Next Second Timothy 4, 1 through 8. It says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead and his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. How many of you know that's in the Bible? Yeah, preach yeah. the word. The word preach literally means live. All right. All right. Look it up. Let's put it in there. Live the word. Be ready. Here's that seasonal thing again. 
I don't want to show up hands, but how many of you have been in a season that you're just kind of about ready to get out of that thing? You're ready for that other season to come. You're ready for the, the season of abundance, the season of opportunity, the season of joy, the season of rejoicing. Well, you got to be ready. So you got to be ready when that's here, John, but you got to be ready when it's not here. Yeah. Right. You got to prepare like it's not ever going to come. You got to prepare like it being here anyway and live like it may never get here. Right. Right. You understand what I'm saying? You have to be ready for the next step, but you got to be dedicated to walk out the present one as if it may never get here. Because I can't let my lip fall over my feet and begin to trip me because I'm pouting because I don't like the way things are going. Come on, right. Is that about what it is? Be ready in season, out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned again to fables, aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. And fulfill your ministry. Next page. Mm -hmm. So this is wishing, finishing well next. First, you've got to live the word. I'm sorry. How are you going to live the word? Well, you got to know it. And if you don't know it, you're not going to live it. Right. Right. So you got to know it. And then you got to apply it. Yeah. And you just got to do what he said. Well, I, I tried and I messed up. Well, good. Get, it back, get it right back up and do it again. Yeah. Right. Keep doing it until it becomes part of you so that you have to think to do it. Yeah. Next page. Right. Number two, seasons change. Touch your neighbor and say seasons change. Season change. Don't get down right now. And don't get up right now. If everything's going good, listen, I'm not trying to prophesy doom and gloom, but I'm just trying to tell you that the other side of the corner may flip on you. Yeah. You need to be ready. You know what? If it's good time, put some stuff in the storehouse. Yeah. If it's bad time, start believing God for the good time. Because it's coming. Yeah. Right, right. Number three, stay sober. What does that mean? It means don't be drunk. Yeah. yeah. I looked it up. I thought it was going to be some really, it said, no, just stay sober. <laughs> yeah. It needs to be aware. It needs to be, be constantly aware. Listen, if there's, listen, if you're hearing anything else to say, if, you, if we're not aware of where the Holy Spirit is right now, we're going to be deceived. Right. If, we're not, if we're not engaging him and leaning in to hear what he's got to say, what prompting he has, then we're going to be led astray by all kind of mess. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like this. We'll get to where too easily engaged in political debates yeah. or talking about our feelings or, or uh, you know, uh, all kind of carnal things. We need to be here from God. Yeah. Number four, endure affliction. Oh, boy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's that on the pillow. Yeah, that's a hard <laughs> Let's put that out on the couch. How do you endure affliction? Practice. You know, if you, and this is the thing, I, I don't think I've made a good enough point. Paul writes so often about our walk and he compares it to athletics. To run the race, fight the good fight. Because there are parallels. Because when I, I remember when I played football and we were in the summertime and we didn't have anybody tell us what to do. I bet Brooklyn, you can respond to this. You know, there wasn't anybody telling me to go do, but we would get together on some, in the middle of the summer at night and go run. You know you're in a small town, I guess. No, you know what? We'd go run at 96 degrees at 9 o'clock at night because we knew that by the end of the summer when we've got those pads on and we're huffing and puffing and sucking wind, if we don't run now, we won't be able to make it then. And so nobody was telling us to do it. It wasn't a requirement. We just knew what was coming. Okay. And so the way you get to where you can endure that fourth quarter and it's 100 degrees and like we went to Columbus, Mississippi and they left a decomposing cat in our dressing room. I'm oh, just sorry. You know how we knew we could do it? Because we've been running our butt off all year long already because when the time came, I was prepared. Endure affliction. Next thing. Do the work. Do the work of evangelists. Do the work. Come on. Just do the work. 
Just quit whining and do it. Okay. You know, just do it. Yeah. Right. I need to pray. Just pray. I need to open my Bible. Then open it. All right. It goes from left to right, <laughs> top to bottom. <laughs> what do I read? Start there. It doesn't matter. Just do it. Right. Come on. Touch it every second. Just do it. Just do it. Already. It's <laughs> better. And lastly, wear your collar. Yeah. Wear your collar. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It should not be a shock to those in your life nope. that God has a call in their life. Okay. I, I've always told you this. If people ask me two things, I can't stand it. Are you still going to the gym? <laughs> if they got to ask, that's really hurting my feelings. Are you still a Christian? Are you still preaching? Have you asked me that last night? All right. Well, if you don't know that by the way I've been thrashing about here in the gym, maybe I need to change some things. Did my women? Yes. Thanks, man. Almost done. Yeah. In Australia, my wife used this one time as an example and just blew me away. If you've heard it, just act like you Every year in Australia, they host this five-day-long, 543.7-mile endurance race from Sydney to Melbourne. It is considered among the world's most grueling ultra-marathons. The race is normally only attempted by world-class athletes who train specially for the event. In 1983, a man named Cliff Young showed up at the start of this race. Cliff was 61 years old, wore overalls and work boots. He couldn't afford, uh, you know, horses or tractors, so with the 2,000 sheep on 2,000 acres, uh, acres, he had to run those sheep for two or three days to herd them. Cliff began the, the race basically shuffling his feet to propel himself. Consequently, he fell way behind the field. But to the dismay of all concerned, Cliff won the race. He finished 19 hours, 19 hours ahead of the next runner, setting a new world record. How did he do it? Well, look at Cliff Noah, all the other athletes would run for 18 hours, then sleep for six, and then go again in the morning. Cliff never stopped. He never slept or let up for five days. He never stopped. Running. You know how to beat the devil? Amen. Just don't quit. Amen. You don't have to get there fast. You don't have to get there fancy. You don't have to have Nike shoes or an endorsement. You take those work boots, but if you just keep putting one foot in front of the other, you're going to beat the devil because he has no endurance and you've got all the rest of the turn. Next page. This is Cliff right here. Next page. First John 1, now, let's just look in it real quick. We're going to wind this thing up. Let's just say that you, you're, you're in here this morning and you've made mistakes. You've gotten in here and you got up on the wrong foot. And you've done things and you took a chance and you tried and, and you failed. And now you're sitting there blistering and stinging from that memory. Every time you try to rise up, I told my wife this last night. I'm battling through the fact that the, the devil attacks me all the time about my shoulders. How can you pray for someone else to be healed? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you how. Yeah. I'm going to raise this good arm and I'm going to raise this good arm and I'm going to pray. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Right? Because right? yeah. it doesn't matter what our little pedigree is. It matters who he is, what he said he's going to do. Yeah. It's all about him and not my performance in it. So here's what I'm going to tell you. First time one night as we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't care if you've blown it every way you can try. Get up again and start over. Get up again and start over. Ask forgiveness. Put it behind you and move on to the next. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is a brand new day. I don't care what you've done, how you felt, who messed it up. Start over today. Yeah, that's right. And finish your course. Wear your call. Complete your ministry. Next page. In Philippians 3, this is the thing that I want to end with. So, brethren, I do not count myself to apprehend but one thing. When he says one thing, I think it's important that you make note. If you don't do anything else, if you want to finish well, if you want to finish 
Well, you better learn this one thing. Okay. One thing I do, I forget those things which are behind. Come on. You need to have a quick reset. Yeah. Okay. You need to have a terrible memory. You need to not carry with you a file on every mistake you've ever made and drag that behind you and everybody that's hurt you and everything that went wrong. You need to be 10 second Tom and every day's a new day with you. You need to be Dora. Oh, hey. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward. I'm so glad it didn't say looking forward, but reaching. Putting some effort on your side. You want things to be different? Quit whining about the way it was. Quit waiting for somebody to do you something, do something for you, and reach forward into the area where the prize exists. Because those things are ahead of you. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Next page. I'm going to lower the lights, and y'all you know, probably heard these stories in their time, but I, I looked it up just to make sure. Because this is amazing to me. I told this story last week, and uh, my kids are in music, and I've told them this. And there's a group, a secular group called Goo Goo Dolls. You ever heard of them? Yeah. Well, they were a garage band. They finally got a, a record deal, and and they gave them a limited deal and they sent them out on the road. And back in those days, they would send out 45s, or at least a CD with two songs on them, kind of a front and back of A and B. Yeah. And they toured, and, and nothing was going well, and they just like nobody was coming to the shows. And finally, the record company sent word to them, we're going to cut your tour short, bring you back in. And all of a sudden, one specific DJ flipped that record over and played this song on the other side named Iris. And he said from the last show where they couldn't hardly fill up a concert hall, they went to this next place and it was sold out and everybody's singing their songs back to them. And they're looking at each other like, what happened? And all of a sudden, it went from here to here. He said, we were so excited, they extended the tour, and when we got back to, off the tour, they called us in and said, I got good news, the record company said, I got good news for you. You only owe us $250,000. And Resnick's the guy's name, he said, if I ever thought about quitting, it was then. Not when we couldn't fill up the hall, but after we come to this place, mm -hmm. and I realize I'm still a million miles away. Because it said like this, you've got your whole life to write your first record and six months to write your second. Mm -hmm. And he said, Brian Block said it, and suddenly I just couldn't do anything. And all of a sudden I had tasted of this success that I would never see. Well, everybody wants that success. And everybody wants whatever it is, whether it's you want to be a success, you want to feel like that what you're doing matters and that, that, that you can mark your, especially men, maybe not women as much, but I know men, we feel like we want to make our mark. I've got a little dog and that's all he wants to do. Pepe, all he wants to do is mark stuff. I wonder if that's how we look to God anyway. But, uh, wow. wow. But the example's been given of the Chinese bamboo tree. This is, this is the Chinese bamboo tree. If you want to plant this, this, this species, you put this bulb in the ground, and you cover it with dirt, and you water it, and you fertilize that bulb, and you water, you water it for one year, every day, two years, every day. If you miss a day, it dies. Three years, four years, five years. Now you don't think about feeling like you're stupid and, and, a, and a failure and chasing a rabbit that this, this is possible. There's no way this can, can possibly work. Yeah. 
I've been doing this for five years, nothing but a mud hole. But in the first 80 days of the sixth year, it grows 90 feet tall. That's crazy, man. And everybody wants the 90 feet in 80 days. It grows so fast, you can hear it growing. That's correct. And we all want that part. Right. And if it was like that, it'd be easy to finish well. <laughs> yeah. But you got to be like Cliff. You just got to do what you know to do, and you got to keep doing it. You got to do it every day. And there's nobody applauding you. There's nobody running with you. There's nobody to measure yourself against. You just got to know in whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded he is able. And I know that I may have come through the driest time of my life, but there's a new season about to break forth. I may have come through the time where I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew I was going to keep doing it anyway. And I'm bringing my body into subjection. I'm bringing myself into a place of self-control. I'm not letting the devil have the satisfaction of running me rookshot everywhere. I'm going to do what I know and I'm going to keep doing what I do. They asked John Wesley before he died, he said, if you knew that Jesus was coming back tomorrow, what would you do? He said, I'd get up at five and pray, and I'd go down to the plant and I'd preach to the people, that the workers is just coming in. He said, wait a minute, that's what you do every day. He said, I live every Day is that people are coming back. And I'm just telling you, I believe we are coming into a new season, a new age of the church, a new age of, the, of what God's doing, and we have got to get ourselves ready, and it's time for you to decide, I'm going to finish well. I don't care what's happened before. I don't care what's going on in my life. I'm putting that stuff behind me. I'm forgetting those things which have gone on before, and I'm going to press forward, reaching in to my destiny. I want you to pray with me right now. But we just pray this morning. Just ask you right now, Lord, just that if there's any of us in this room, that we need to say, Lord, I've been dragging failure, I've been dragging disappointment, I've been dragging all this stuff behind me, and I'm ready to cut it loose. I'm ready to enjoy my life. I'm ready to let those things that land on God where they belong, and I'm going to make sure that from here on I'm going to finish well. I'm not going to finish as a consolation prize. I'm not going to finish as, as some sort of second tier. But I'm going to go for the very thing. I'm going to go for your best. I'm going to go for what you put me here to do. I'm going to finish my calling. Fulfill my ministry. Live up my days in honor of you. And I pray for us this morning, Lord God, if, if, if we've had mistakes and discouragement and and we look at ourselves and we're open book. We're just like, a, the devil has an open channel in our head to condemn us, to criticize us, to accuse us. Father, we want to cut that loose tonight and not listen to what he has to say anymore because I'm not measuring myself against others or where I think, where the devil thinks I ought to be by this time. I'm just going to keep moving my feet, walking forward because I know that I'm going to win this race because I'm going to run in such a way like I'm going to win. Would you head down the aisle? Just quickly, let me pray for you. Anybody want to raise your hand beside? I heard you today. I want to I want to cut that stuff loose. I'm going to take this as my day. Yes, sir. Anybody else? This is my day to start new. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Yes, sir. Father, we're waving our hands as you say this is the end of the old, beginning of the new. I'm not looking back. I'm not dragging it behind me. This is all I want is to be where you want me to be. All I want to do is finish well to let the, the tape break across my chest as I cross the finish line where you will say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. And we praise you, Lord God. We just thank you. We receive it as done. Everybody stand with me.